test here. I'm going to test it. Testing three, two, one. And then, like I said, I've got a couple more in the works. I've got um, someone who's going to talk about uh, James Blackshear, who wrote a book about Fort Bascom a few years ago and is going to hopefully talk to us about Fort Bascom. Um, right now, he's leaning more towards May, so I'd still have to find someone for April. But And then, like I said, further down the road next autumn, we have got... Hopefully we will get um, Paul Andrew Hutton to talk to us about uh, Sheridan's winter campaign of 1868 and 1869, which would have partially passed through here and would have had a lot of connection to our area. But tonight um, we have got Dr. Shelley Lemons and Dr. Stephen Kite. Uh, Shelley is at McKendry University, right Shelley? Yes, that's right. And that's just outside of St. Louis, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. in Lebanon, Illinois. Okay, and then Stephen Kite is a professor of history at the University of Arkansas at Fort Smith, right, Stephen? That's right. That's okay. in Fort Smith. It's in Fort Smith, right. So, um, and they were, you know, um, before COVID hit and everything crashed, they were <laughs> through the museum a couple of years ago, um, wanting to look through a lot of our archives, a lot of, of period sources and so on, primary sources that we would have, that we had uh, dealing with the Dust Bowl and so on. And so when I started brainstorming for ideas about, to, you know, for these programs, Shelley was a name, Shelley and Stephen were some names that came to mind because they had been through here. And obviously, since they had been pawing through our materials, then that made them particularly interesting, interesting to me. Um, and so, like I said, without, without any further ado, I'll quit yapping and let them take the floor, all right? And thank you all very much for coming tonight, by the way. Yes. And thank you, Seth, for inviting us. Uh, Steve and I, well, you'll know by the time we're done, uh, we really, really love this project that we've been working on in a variety of different ways for more than 20 years now. So before Seth was at the museum, we were working on this project that we're going to yeah. talk about tonight. Yeah, we're excited to be here to just uh, have someone or to talk about it to other people that might be excited about it. <laughs> it's always nice to find uh, like-minded souls. That's right. So um, we actually were uh, in the museum when and uh, Seth, you might, or someone might have to help us when Ken was mm -hmm. the director there. And uh, does anyone know Ken's last name? Ken Turner. Ken Turner. Turner, Turner. Turner. Yes. that's right. We were just trying to think of that today and we're, we're kind of beating our brains for the last name. But yeah, he, he was kind of our introduction to, um, to the museum and the, and the people around there. But uh, but All right, well, we are calling. We need, to, we need to back up. We need to tell about the beginning of this project that got us out in the panhandle anyhow, Steve. Well, I, I wanted to let them know that we were calling their museum an oasis. We are calling your museum an oasis because it truly <laughs> was for us. My goodness, we started something ambitious and needed some help more than once. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, uh, we, Shelly and I both worked in the Oklahoma State University uh, Library uh, archives, and we were, um, there was money available for research into women's history. Uh, you could get uh, state or federal monies in if you were working on something involved with women's history. And so, all of us at the uh, Special Collections and Archives started to kind of brainstorm what we could do uh, to uh, hopefully get some funding and come up with a project that fit. And we, we landed on um, women who experienced or lived through the Dust Bowl. Uh, through that? And uh, that was our, and, and Charlotte, you want to go on from there? 
I'm sorry, I didn't hear that part. Oh, I just said we kind of decided to focus uh, our research on women who experienced and lived through the Dust Bowl. Yeah, so I was hired at University Archives and Special Collections to work with Steve on a project to collect oral history interviews of women who had lived through the Dust Bowl in the 30s. But man, we you know knew a lot about the historiography of the Dust Bowl, but didn't know a lot of people who had lived through the Dust Bowl. So we were really dependent on our first uh, oasis out into the panhandle uh, was to try to contact historical societies and museums to try to help us identify people in their communities who might be willing to talk to a couple of yahoos from Stillwater who would drive out um, to visit with them and ask some questions for oral history recording. We were calling who were we, what were we doing? Oh, we were calling like retirement centers and nursing homes and um, just not getting anywhere with finding people to talk to with our oral history project. It just wasn't working out. But once we stumbled onto the No Man's Land Museum and made a connection with Ken Turner, not only was he willing to provide us with names of people that we could talk to, which was the lifeblood for the early part of this project, but he also offered museum space. So the oasis at No Man's Land ended up being twofold for us for this particular project. So um, even though you probably already know all of this, we we didn't, you know, we don't know who we're talking to out there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we just thought we'd kind of uh, start from the beginning, right? And what uh, what the heck is this dust bowl, and uh, and why why does it matter? Well, I wanted to to clarify too that we were really adamant that our study of women uh, in the dust bowl was, would focus on women who stayed in the dust bowl and didn't leave. So, I mean, people that you know the Okies that migrated out, we weren't dealing with those. We wanted to really focus in on the the women and their families that that had that stayed there and stayed through it. Um, and so that's kind of, that was our target audience. But of course, you know, uh, being there, that um, that's an area of high sustained winds. You know, um, it's windy out there, it's dry out there, and the um, soil system is very fragile, the root system is very fragile. And um, that was the, uh, the soil and the root system was disturbed right through through uh, over plowing, plowing this fragile ecosystem. Um, in the late 1920s, the uh, prices, commodity prices had kind of bottomed out after World War I and farmers were plowing up more and more and more land to try to make more and more money or any money. And they started to uh, disturb uh, areas out in the high plains that shouldn't have been disturbed. And then that, uh, plowing combined with the high winds and then the cyclical drought created the perfect storm that you're looking at in that picture, right? This series, an ongoing series of uh, dust storms that we call the Dust Bowl. For me, I was really interested in looking at the Dust Bowl, not just in a geographical area, because I had some affinity for where the Dust Bowl had, had happened, but I was really more interested in sort of the people, as Steve said, the people who had stayed, where they lived, and what it was like there. When we first started this project in 2001, I had never been west of I-35. I'm from the Ozarks in Missouri, and I had moved to Stillwater not that long before, but had no idea what it was like as you got into Beaver, Texas, and Cimarron counties in Oklahoma. But in the eye of the storm, as you can see on this map here, sort of like the, the location where you guys are, as you know, is sort of right in the smack center of this story that has gone on for a decade in the 1930s. You guys are in the most severe dot. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's crazy, right, that um, every year, every year that this continued to go on, um, and I'm pointing at the, I'm pointing at the map, um, <laughs> that you guys, Cimarron and Texas counties were always in the middle of the worst of the worst. I mean, some, like Nebraska, look, 
Nebraska can barely claim a Dust Bowl. Look at that up there. Kansas, <laughs> yes. Colorado, okay. But, but that panhandle, and especially Cimarron and Texas counties, were just, were just the epicenter of this Dust Bowl uh, event. Well, once we went out into the panhandle and went to places like the museum there in Goodwill, uh, I started to see that it isn't just a place on a map, and it is the people's stories that I was most interested in, and began to really connect uh, a part of myself professionally, I think you say the same thing, uh, with this portion of the country. And so we um, affectionately, and I hope that this doesn't feel offensive in any way, because we don't mean it that way, I mean it very affectionately, uh, that we'll refer to the panhandle of Oklahoma as the yoke because this map, uh, it looks like a fried egg and you guys are right there in the yoke, right in the center of all of it. So when we talk about the yoke, we mean you and, and, and it's really, really important to my heart <laughs> that you understand that it's really a, a term of endearment uh, to refer to the people of the yoke and see the stories that we learned uh, whenever we were working on this project sure. and as we continue to work on this project as we move forward. Show them the, show them the map of the yoke. I did oh. show them the map of the yoke. Okay. No, I mean you're the, the homemade map right behind you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's this map also of the yoke. So there's your pins in, in Guymon and Goodwell of all the places we've been or need to go. Uh, yeah, it's it's positioned behind me uh, whenever I do my work because I need, I need there. All right. Now you have so me all flustered, Kite. Now you got to talk a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just going to roll through some pictures of these dust storms, and even though they're kind of ubiquitous and you've seen them before, just to kind of prepare, you know, like when you when we talk about the interviews that we did out there, uh, you know, this is what these ladies were facing, right? So some, I think it's kind of good to show these kinds of pictures to uh, to set the scene, and we chose dramatic pictures, not just from Texas County, but from all around the area. Just, I mean, you know, uh, just to kind of show what life was like in the middle of all of this, these, these dusters or rollers came in, you know, periodically. It, it's not all the time that it looked like this, but the, it was enough, right, that people uh, uh, had to uh, face it on a regular basis. And uh, in this picture. <laughs> and these people hardly look disturbed by this thing. <laughs> Come in. And I had seen this picture before we started doing interviews. I thought, how could you not like notice that behind you? But then after connecting with the women that we talked to, we talked to about a hundred women uh, for our oral history project, talking with them, it became such a commonplace experience that it was not something that warranted an uh, uh, outcry other things warranted outcry and we've got some surprises for you here in just a little bit but it wasn't this dust storm that got them excited right i can't imagine what that was like uh to actually be there especially the first time this is in uh cimarron county but it's so dramatic right the the farmer and the the two sons running, and the, this is uh, in felt. It's uh, just uh, kind of across the highway uh, from the town of, of felt. Uh, and of course, I mean, this is land that never should have been plowed up, never should have been worked, uh, ne that never should have been disturbed, but it it was, and and it's blown away. There's there's his uh, down payment then going out of his hand. His mortgage is, is sifting out of his hands. And the farm machinery being buried and the cars being buried. We heard these kinds of stories over and over again. Um, the picture with the, the tractor, the John Deere buried, not just in sand, but also in tumbleweed. The man with the mask on his face seems very reminiscent in some ways of things that, that we maybe have more of a connection to now than Steve and I did when we were hearing these stories the first time out. But, you know, as we got to talking to people and started connecting with them and they started to tell us more of their experiences of the 30s, it isn't just dirt storms that got our attention. Sometimes the stories were much more extreme, like stories of rabbit drives. Yeah, this kind of, um, I mean, I had read about this before, uh, but to actually see pictures of rabbit drives was really... Uh, I don't know a lot. I mean, impressive and disturbing at the same time. 
<laughs> you know and then that, she um, tell the stories of it. Of uh, uh, one uh, woman that we talked to, she went on her first date with her future husband to a rabbit drive. <laughs> right. I mean, stories. You know, there were there wasn't there wasn't a lot to do out there on a first date, but I can think of some things better than a rabbit drive. I, she, I don't think she was. I don't think she was too impressed, was she, Shelley? No, she was most concerned because she had torn her jacket on the barbed wire fence, and she was not disturbed at all by the things that were happening with the, the rabbit drive itself. But that just goes to show that a lot of our perceptions and images we have about the past really don't necessarily match up until you're actually talking with people who have experienced it firsthand. Right. So uh, we put this... Uh, slide here or we're using this slide to I think kind of show how deeply embedded in our culture and our history uh, the Dust Bowl is right I mean Woody Guthrie an Oklahoman uh, sings about the Dust Bowl and his Dust Bowl ballads you know they, and they have the Dust pneumonia and you don't have to be from Oklahoma to have uh, the Dust Bowl kind of in your in your DNA, you know, I mean, in your, you, uh, might, you might have to be from Oklahoma to know where the heck it is on a map. Um, then the next slide we have is uh, from, I had to set it up for you a little bit before I share it with you. Um, so Jess Porter, who is a geographer, uh, wrote an article about uh, lessons from the Dust Bowl. And he asked high school students who were not, I mean, these were students who had seen maps before. Uh, he asked them to draw on a map where the Dust Bowl had occurred. And then he superimposed all of their drawings onto a singular map and then outlined where the Dust Bowl actually occurred. And this is what we ended up with. Yeah, so there's your, there's the egg. And then there's where everyone drew the Dust Bowl. <laughs> Everywhere. Remember the earlier map when Nebraska barely has any claim to Dust Bowl heritage at all? We have people all live here in Canada uh, with the Dust Bowl and sort of how they, perceived sort of this, this phenomenon in part of a cultural memory versus where it actually existed geographically, very, very different. But you know, are, are most of us that much different when we think about our perceptions of, of things that, we, that, that feel familiar? Shelly, somebody's putting the Dust Bowl over there in your neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Dust, yeah, the right dust Bowl. Here. <laughs> So. The Kendra University is covered in dust. That's right. That's right. Not today no. and, and not then either. Uh, but when, when I ask my students what they think about, you know, sort of women in the Dust Bowl, this is what they always describe to me. It's always migrant mother. It's always people who have left, um, who are fleeing to California, not the people who stayed and became the cornerstones of their community. Yeah, right. The, um, yep, yeah, right. So, we think, we think, uh, and it's often kind of exaggerated how many people left, right, during the storms and the drought and the depression and all of that. But uh, I think, I mean, and th those are awesome stories, you know, I mean, Grapes of Wrath and whatnot. Um, but uh, but there's, <laughs> there is a lot of stuff going on in Oklahoma, in, in the Panhandle during this. And that's what we really were... Um, <laughs> digging into, so to speak. So our project, so we, when we got the funding, we started with that project, it was in 2001. And so this is already going to be dealing with an aged population. Yeah, you know, we kind of looked at um, who, right? Um, we kind of tried to identify the population of women that that would be most, like whose stories were getting close to being gone forever. And and um, quickly, we, you know, came to uh, realize the Dust Bowl survivors were, were a great audience to interview. So Ken Turner to the rescue. That's right. And I don't know how many of these names you guys in, in the room or in the Zoom call will recognize. But these are the women from Texas County or the women who were interviewed in Texas County for the original project. So L. Ann Berry, Juanita Gilmore, Bessie Harold, Mildred Geist, Betty Stevens, Selma Murphy. 
all of we the thought maybe some of you guys might be related to these people <laughs> i don't know are these are these family names that that you still hear in texas county i don't know i knew juanita gilmore real well well you yeah. should you um she uh, it was yeah um very quiet in her interview but she had a lot of real gem stories to share with us for sure while she was there evelyn whiskey i don't think i said her name out loud but she's not on that list but there's more <laughs> i'm a jean glover uh, i'm hearing some rumbling are these people that you know yeah yes. mm -hmm. yeah peterson yeah, well, you're going to hear from some of these women here in just a moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love hearing those murmurs that you know these names. Yes. We were hoping we would. We were hoping you would know some. Right. And then, and then one last list. For you. I didn't see them. Dean oh. Kerr, Joanne Kerr, Margie Lang. Now, occasionally we had a gentleman wander into our interview set, but for the most part, we were targeting women. And you notice that these uh, names are grouped together. <clears throat> these lists are together because we did block interviewing whenever we were in the panhandle to do these original sets. Steve, you want to talk about why we did it that way? Well, yeah. Um, we. So we interviewed, you know, you can see the first interview we did was two people, but then we have as many as five. I mean, I, I, I think we had more, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's five. I think we had more than that at different times, but <clears throat> there was just no way. Uh, well, there's a couple of different reasons why it ended up being this way. One, there was no way we could interview. Uh, we could do these as individual interviews. It would just take too long and we didn't have that amount of time. And two, um, some of the women uh, refused to come talk to us unless they had their friends with them. <laughs> and so uh, they ended up coming in pairs and trios and whatnot. And at and first, then, as I tend to do, I panicked. I thought, how are we going to handle all of this? <laughs> right. Well, then, and you're going to really hear this later, uh, but we found out that it was to our advantage to have these groups of women all in the same room at the same time because they totally like they they ping ponged off each other and they fed each other and energy was building and they got all excited and they were talking and it was a really really uh, a good thing that they were all there together but right, well, how do you do it Shelly Oh my gosh, how do we do it? Well, we ended up doing it as good thing there were two of us to tag team. One of us would serve as a, an interviewer for a session and we would give the prompts to our narrators and allow them to tell their stories. And the other of the team would serve as a note taker where they were trying to record who was talking and what stories they were telling to help with transcription later and also with identities uh, for people who had been um, interviewed. But I have a clip to play for you. Are we ready to go for that? Well, I was going to say this, Shelly, before you play the clip. Okay. That um, so we would take we would take pictures of every person that would help us to identify because th then we would write down like the note taker, whoever was the note taker for that particular interview, would write down like Dolores Pifo, red sweater with glasses and big necklace, and then we, <laughs> and we would like identify them, you know, and then we would uh, we would the note taker would. Um, write down like it maybe initials or like red sweater or something and then and then the first few words of the of their sentence so we would when we got back to Stillwater we would be able to look at those notes and identify who was saying each of these snippets but sometimes it was like a uh, pro wrestling match in there <laughs> you, didn't know, you didn't know who was saying what right right all right so every time steve and, I, and and again steve and i we we worked on this as uh as a team doing the interviews and it was so much fun and uh, just really just a special time as a as a person as a professional uh, to be able to participate in this project and then every time we've come back either when we've written an article or we'll talk about some of the projects we're working on now with it using the museum collections 
it's just just a moment to go back and hear these women's voices and hear their stories in their own words. So we thought what we would do tonight is share a little bit of a highlight reel with you because the interviews are digitized and they're available uh, through the Oklahoma State University Special Collections website. In addition to some hard copies that were delivered to the No Man's Land Museum and other two museum cooperators that we worked with on this project. But the first highlight I have for you um, is the Eileen Couch, Lula Wood, Emma Weeks, uh, Vernal Fox, and Christine Tate interview uh, from Guyman, um, where they talk about a dust storm, hiding in a fort of tumbleweeds, chickens being blown across the field, and a sense of community. So let me pull this up for you so that you can listen and see this interview. So just a little bit of it, not the full hour, of course, uh, but uh, a highlight from this. We should get it started officially. Okay. And uh, we usually do that by just going around the table and stating your name and where you were born and when. Well, Eileen Couch, and I was born here in 23, 1923. Uh -huh. And I've lived here all my life. And the most vivid memory I have of the dirt storm days was one Easter Sunday, and I think it's that April 14th storm that we still talk about. Sunday. About five or six of the cousins had decided to walk from Grandpa's farm over to Uncle Dick's farm. It was probably two miles, I don't remember. But it was a beautiful day, and we walked over and uh, started back, and this black storm came rolling in. So we finally got to where we couldn't see even your hand in front of your face. It was just completely black. And we walked until we came. Vernon, my older brother, had us hold hands. And we walked until we came to a fence, a barbed wire fence. Then we followed the fence a little ways, and he picked up tumbleweeds that had was blowing against the fence and made a little fort for us, a little windbreaker, and had us all sit there and wait until somebody came to look for us. And sure enough, eventually here came Grandpa in his old car, and Mom was sitting on the fender, and they had the lights on, but they couldn't see us until they were right upon us, but we were sure glad to see them. And, of course, we all crawled in the car and got back home. But there were a lot of times like that. But that's the one memory that I have of the dirt storms. You were riding on the fender. I guess. <laughs> I don't remember, but I yes. probably was. How do you spell your first name? A L I N E. Aileen? Aileen? Aileen. Aileen. Mm -hmm. All right. There's a couple ways you can pronounce that, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right. Your turn. Uh, what was your, your first name and maiden name and married name? And well, I was Lula Ryder, and I married Theo Wood in 1919. And we were poor folks. We didn't know it. But anyway, we had lots of dirt storms. One dirt storm I remember that came in from the north. Hold on. You're, when were you born? 1903. 1903. Okay, so you win the prize for, for the table today. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, we had the dirt storms, and one that I remember, the wind, the wind come up from the north, and we had a lot of chickens, and it was in the daytime, and of course they wasn't in the hen house where they should have been or where they ought to have been, but it blew them down in the pasture. And after the the storm was over, while well, we went and picked up the chickens, and it had kind of I don't know if it's snow or rain, but it's mud, you know, on those chickens. And we went and picked up chickens out of the pasture south of the house. And I remember that. And they go on to talk in this particular interview about where they lived in a dugout and how they lived in a house that wouldn't be fit to live in now. But they say, you know, times go hard, but we didn't know it. We were just happy. Yeah. It's all in perspective. <laughs> I'm going to get the next one ready, Steve. All right. So and so, one of the, the magical things that would happen is these women would be very nervous to uh, come talk to us. And like I said, they would bring their friends along with them to kind of bolster their confidence or to uh, 
I don't know what, just be companionship. And, uh, but they would sit down and start talking. And then, and then uh, it was kind of hard to get them to stop, which was a good thing. Uh, but it was just funny to watch that transformation happen once they started remembering and they would see or they would hear someone across the room say something, then they go, oh yeah, we had bed bugs too, you know, and they're away they go in that conversation. And it was just really, uh, it, it was really contagious. Well, you get a little taste of that in the next clip we have for you uh, from Imogene Glover, Alma Ogden, Verdine Rollins, and Imogene Jackson in another Guyman interview when they're talking about getting access to water. Um, a cistern, uh, and stories of a cistern led to uh, stories of a sod house and a tumbleweed fort. So some good stories coming with this one too. We had to pump the water, you know, to drink. And, uh, we hauled water from the creek uh, until we, we had the well. So did they. They hauled water the, early and home. put it in barrels. But then, then, but then yeah, I remember seeing them down in eastern Oklahoma. But then they hauled water from the Palladoro to the cistern. Well, and they hauled water from the Palladoro to the cistern. And to this day, there's not any good water on that place. Goodness. Well, no. that's right. It's still, it's yeah. salty, the water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh. Well, Orville and I bought the see, I land for Grandma Homestead. <laughs> the Paladuro is your land? The corner of it. Uh -huh. was a, the creek that ran through it, yeah. See, oh, yeah. see well, now, Paladuro Canyon at Amarillo is I'm different from, than this Paladuro. This is a little place over out here, my heart. Over, over by range is where it's The, the Paladuro is the creek. It runs down there across the corner of that head. And there's no down. good water on that section. So. Right. So, yeah. and so, so their yeah. cattle had to be driven to the creek to drink because they never had any well there. Right, because the land was pretty plentiful then. But I was always kind of amazed by that system because I never seen one before and haven't seen it's one It's still since. there, and it, right there by the house. The sod house is still there. And the sod house is still standing. <laughs> you see it? Yeah. yeah. It's you covered bet. with cement on the outside, yeah. but it's there. Yeah. Huh. It's on yeah. the land that we bought. And there's another thing that, that I remember with the kind of a chuckle is we have pictures of that sod house with uh, tumbleweeds growing on top of it. <laughs> and cactus. Speaking of tumbleweeds, and you ask about <laughs> games we played, when I was a kid, one Sunday we went to the neighbors and there was a draw down there about, oh, half a mile west of where some of these, uh, their relatives lived. Uh -huh. And uh, there were two boys, Betty Jean Mulkey and uh, Wayman H. Mulkey, and my brother, J.R. Davison, and I ran down there, and there was kind of a little, uh, I don't know, maybe some boards across to make a little bridge across this gully, but we were playing right below that, and there was just tumbleweeds had blown in there with the dust storms till it was as high as this ceiling, the tumbleweeds. We decided to pull those out and build us a house, and we even put a roof on it. When my mother found out that's what we'd been doing, she just had a fit. What if they'd have caught fire? Yeah. And well, I said, well, we didn't have any matches. <laughs> but we built us a house out of tumbleweeds, and we played all afternoon with tumbleweeds. <laughs> So that's how kids can make do if they don't have toys. Or you can have a good time. Yeah. And they did have a good time. That was one of the things I noticed over and over again with these stories. Steve, yeah. I'm pulled up. Go ahead. Oh, no, it was just, uh, I was going to say that uh, the, it kind of goes back to that perspective of they had no idea you know, that they were poor or didn't have anything because that, they were all that way, right? So having a, a backyard or a field full of tumbleweeds as your toy chest was just normal everyday uh, behavior. Well, the next clip I have is a little shorter. Um, and this one is set up by, they were the women, this is the Bessie Harold, Mildred Geist, 
Betty Stevens, Selma Murphy, and Evelyn uh, Witzke interview, and they were talking about their fathers working for the WPA and the New Deal, and how they kind of always saw themselves as being a part of the sort of early New Deal, uh, with the story about why they don't like to eat soup. But there's a story behind the story, and you'll hear it in the interview if you're listening. Um, when we went to Bessie Harold's house in Hooker to do this interview, it was in the middle of a dust storm. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it was April 11th. I mean, it was <laughs> three days off from the April 14th, 1935, tremendous dust storm. And we were there and uh, in the middle of uh, kind of a modern duster rolling in and it it was blowing shingles off of bessie harold's house <laughs> it was. while we were in there interviewing mm -hmm. well there that goes another that, one when we were driving out uh highway 412 driving out into texas county to her house we came over one of those little hills and there was like a wall of tumbleweeds coming at our car and <laughs> that was something uh power poles being snapped and all those sorts of things and we're at bessie harold's house and they're telling a story not bothered one bit by the weather outside, but very adamant to tell us why they no longer enjoyed soup. So here is the story of the soup. And my dad worked on the WPA to help us get through the 30s. Mm -hmm. My what? mother died in 1930, so it was just the start of the Depression. What did your dad do for the WPA? He took his horses and frizz and all and mm -hmm. helped build roads. I like your daddy. Mm -hmm. So did Ray. Mm -hmm. And he helped build the fence around the fairground at Liberal. Oh, yeah. And it's still standing. Mm -hmm. The Second Street Road is what he worked on. I often thought we were the beginning of the WPA because <laughs> when I was a freshman in high school, we started the soup kitchen for the school. Mm -hmm. And we, the home economics class, served soup. We, we cooked the meal. We cooked soup huh. every day for the whole school. And the janitor. And the And what was uh, real interesting, the year I, after I graduated from high school, they hired fellows that worked on the WPA to start I cooking the that. soup. I was over here in the third grade. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> we had potato soup running out of ears, didn't we? One, one of the, I haven't, <laughs> it took me a long time to like soup again. But uh, what was really funny, you know, they and people would send in chickens yeah, and things. Chickens Sometimes and we had to dress them. Once in a while they dressed them and sent them in. But one day we always made two great big pots. And this one kettle just kept boiling over and boiling over and boiling over. And we, we noticed that the bowls kept coming back nearly full. And when we got down to the bottom of that pot that day, there was a bar of soap in the bottom. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I wonder nobody wanted to eat it. You know, you use that brown bar of soap. Homemade, probably. Uh -huh. oh, my <laughs> so, it took me a long time to like soup. It was I'm healthy it. anyway. Oh, I don't know. Put that lye in it, I don't think so. No, not with that. But you didn't get enough of that. Uh, well, they didn't eat much. <laughs> it wasn't a good soup day. No, a good soup day. <laughs> it was not a good soup day. <laughs> soap, soap in the soup. I was going to say that uh, we were in Guyman when that that windstorm was there that day, and we were eating. Do you remember? We talked about this, Shelley. We were eating lunch at a restaurant. You guys will know where this is, probably. And then there was like a like a burger place called the Burger Barn across the street from the restaurant we were in head nods, yeah <laughs> and we were eating we were eating in there and look out the window and the roof was blown off the burger barn <laughs> it was crazy that day was crazy yeah you know sometimes we we're hearing stories about things that we would never ever have known to ask about and so the last clip that i have uh, from this project to share with you is from the Norlene Peterson, Mildred Jacobs, and Doralene Wilson interview uh, from Hooker, Oklahoma. And they were, they were talking about their mutual hatred for cleaning the cream separator, which seemed like a pretty reasonable kind of uh, conversation we've been hearing over and over again. But then it became a story of a brother who had left to go to California riding the rails as a hobo and then that story mor morphed into these women telling us about gypsies in the panhandle. So I was, hold on, Shelley. I was going to say that one of the one of the kind of things you have to balance out in an oral history project is coming in with pre-made questions. You know, you do your research 
you do your uh, investigating, you create questions that you think would be uh, important to ask, but then you don't want to you don't want to script your interview too much because then it loses the spontaneity and it loses the off the cuff stories. So, I mean, we, we came in with some questions, but for the most part, we just kind of pressed record and let these ladies roll. And you could hear that in some of those earlier interviews, they would just get kind of crazy in there. Well, we did not even know to create questions about gypsies and these ladies get, they get going and out come these stories. So, all right. All right, so gypsies in Texas County. Oh, I hated to watch, oh, I hated that, to watch thing. that thing. Oh, I did too. And it was when, such a moaning sound, lonesome sound. I don't remember the sound. I remember having all to watch those discs. Yes, had to fit just exactly right. Sometimes we had a cow, and sometimes we separated the milk. And I had it was since I was the oldest of five. It was my job to wash it and clean it up. And if I didn't wash it and clean it up, the next day's milk would be no good. Yeah, it'd be sour. <laughs> anyway, this brother that played poker. He and two other brothers got on the boxcar on top, you know, with the oboes, mm -hmm. and they went to California. Oh. Uh, and they found work there. And uh, eventually my mother moved out there, too, during World War, before two. World War II. She moved there, and she passed away there, but we brought her back home. But I was married by that time, and uh, so I didn't go to California, only on visits. Uh, the hobos were thick. Oh, Just yes. You, they'd have to fight almost for a place to sit on uh -huh. the, the railroad. Rock Island Railroad mm -hmm. that comes through. Do you all remember it, seeing hobos and tramps? Do you remember gypsies? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, my dad's filling station, they'd come in there. and My mother would say, they'd, somebody would holler, gypsies are in town, grab your kids because they'll take your kids and they'll kidnap them and you'll never see them again. I want to hear all your gypsy stories. Let's start with you. Well, they were, were they not Assyrians or? I don't know. They, they were dressed in loud colored oh, right. clothes and handkerchiefs around their heads. And they'd what, stop at the station. What would the men wear? Would they be suits? I, I can't even remember, remember a man. The men. I'm sure a man was around, but I don't remember. I just remember the colorful women. Uh -huh. And um, uh, we were afraid of them, too, that they'd steal things. Well, they would. Mm -hmm. they'd stop. That was their lifestyle. But they'd trade my dad things for gasoline, beads. And I always, I wished I could I kept those beads. I had the prettiest pair of beads that that he brought home. They'd drive cars. Yeah, yeah, they had old cars. Well, the ones that come by home, I the way I remember it, they was, had wagons. Wagons and horse, horse, uh -huh. horse drawn yeah. wagons. Uh -huh. Seems like they uh, sometimes would do cars if they could get them, sometimes wagons. Well, anyway, they stopped at the station to get gasoline, yeah. my dad. So naturally, they. I guess had it would cars. be whatever they, you know, had. Mm -hmm. well, what about your gypsy encounters? Well, we lived kind of down on what they call Teepee Creek, down low, you know, or lower. Mm -hmm. And they would come from the north about a half a mile away. You couldn't see them till you'd see them coming. And. I can still remember Mother saying, get in the house and lock the door, the gypsies are coming. So we would naturally get in the house and I imagine peeped out and everything else, but then they'd come to the door and they wanted a chicken for their sick grandma. And, and beg. Beg and beg. And whether Mother gave them anything, I can't remember. But finally they'd go on. But as I said, the women, always were dressed and had all these great big earrings mm -hmm. and bracelets. bracelets. Now, I can't remember anything about a man. I don't either. I don't, I don't either. Well, of course, we were just kids, children, yeah. tiny we children. We were attracted by the bright colors uh -huh. of the women, I guess. Where, where did you see gypsies? At Hardesty, which, you know, where Hardesty oh, is? Yeah, we came through it on the way here. Okay, I, my most vivid memory of gypsies is living at Hardesty. And someone would come around and let us know, the gypsies are coming, the gypsies are coming. Grab everything, put it in the house, get your kids in the house because they'll kidnap the kids and they'll steal. And we were scared to death. We were, we were you know, frightened, scared of them. Are we taking up too much time? No, no, you got a long time to go. You were scared of them, though. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, everybody was. 
you remember them ever stealing anything from you or your family? Not anything from us, but we just knew that they would. If there was anything they could get a hold of, but everything we had, of course, in, in that day and time and during the Depression and all that, you didn't, we didn't have much, you know. Anything we had, we could probably get into a two-room house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No bathrooms or no running water. No, it was uh -uh. no. What about the tramps or hobos? Did, were you... Well, they would come by, and uh, they would, I can remember mother fixing meals or feed mm. them, and then sometimes they would sleep, I suppose, I don't know whereabouts, but they'd sleep outdoors, so I suppose, you know, but I can still remember them coming, a tramp, and then they'd walk on, and Ask mother uh -huh, mother would fix up something for them to eat, whatever and, and sometimes they'd even say that we will do some some things around here to pay for it. And they were different than gypsies. Oh yes. They were they were people our type of yes, people. Yes, we were the hobos this country. <laughs> we they were, were our the type of people and, and we weren't afraid of them. And I remember my mother was very religious and she used to say, Well, just when the hobos come, just be careful, but she said, Just remember that could be Jesus knocking on your door. <laughs> and uh, we weren't afraid of the hobos. I was more afraid. That story that started with Doralene Wilson talking about her brothers uh, ends up being more powerful in the end than we even realized at the time. Uh, remember, when we started this project, we knew the population that we wanted to talk to was, was getting older and that the time was was of the essence to capture these stories before they were lost. Um, the interview with this set, including Doralee Wilson, took place on April the 13th of 2001, and Mrs. Wilson passed away about six weeks later on May the 31st of 2001. So we just were there just barely in a time to capture um, that story from her. So it's a really yeah. powerful moment. Remind us of what, why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, um, you know, and once, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious, of course, but it's kind of, uh, it sinks in after a while that once these women are gone, and, and I think, Shelly, correct me, but I think almost all the women, 100 plus women we interviewed are gone now. Mm -hmm. um, their stories are gone, right? I mean, there, there's no going back to get those stories. There's no talking to them later. Uh, and that was driven home several different times during our project uh, that we were too late. Somebody we were wanting to talk to had passed on or we had just made it in the nick of time. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's really it really is oral history it really is saving history. Um, and that, that was became so important to us. I was want to say that. Never, I don't, I'll say never in a million years, but never in a long time would we have thought of asking a question about gypsies in the panhandle of Oklahoma in the 1930s. But there they were. Yep. And they steal your kids. <laughs> well, not to get them inside fast enough. <laughs> well, so Steve and I had spent this time in the field and we heard these stories and we worked with people, we connected with people. And then really, I felt very strongly that we needed to make sure that the stories not only were preserved, but shared. And so the, the project from the very beginning included a component to share the oral histories. But then Steve and I, as academics, have all also gone on to write articles on the, the side of the screen here um, is a cover of the Chronicles of Oklahoma in spring of 15, when Steve and I co-authored a piece rooted in the plains on Oklahoma women and community. Um, but it became a passion project of more than just academic writing, as the women that we had talked to almost made us feel like we were connected and part of their family. So do you remember in the clip we just heard just a few ago, a few minutes ago, about talking about the sod house covered in cement? It's still they standing. Gave us, they gave us directions how to get there, and, and we went there. I don't know why my screen isn't advancing. Here we go. Uh, we went there. Uh, we we followed the directions that seemed kind of ridiculous at the time. Go to the intersection where the house used to be on one side, and they moved it to the other side. I'm like, 
what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> then we're driving along and sure enough, oh wait, there's a line of trees and the flowers that that's where they moved the house from one side to the other side. Let's turn, turn, turn south here. And then here, here we are at the sod house covered in cement. Yeah. So we go snooping around and uh, I mean, there's, you know, this is the house they were talking about where the cistern was there and there are two rooms, uh, Saudi with it uh, that's still there. And we, and then Shelly looking, <clears throat> look inside. And then there's, the, I mean, that's got to be original to that house, right? I mean, what else would that still be doing there? Now the refrigerator, the letter B refrigerator magnet, magnet there is not original to the state. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> I mean, so now you guys, Seth, we were trespassing on this land. Don't tell anyone. We were but, in, uh, well, now they, I thought it said we were invited. We were invited when we went in 2001. This picture is actually from 2011. That picture Steve has, let me stop my share for a second. That picture that Steve has, if you say something, you should light up and become the big. Hello, picture. hello. That's this picture, picture was the one taken in 2001. Right, from the day they gave us the directions to get there. You can so see then, the cistern that they're talking about in the back. Yeah, and so then this picture uh, with the, the newly installed fence is from when we went back on a 10-year visit in 2011. We did this, right? I mean, we were like, uh, these women drew us in with their stories, and we just became fascinated by everything they were, they had lived through and they experienced. So we would, like, we would drive to where their stories were taking place. We'd hear these stories, and then we would drive out there to see the site where it all happened. And even, um, yeah, later, like Shelly said, 10 years later, right, we went back out there and we visited some of them. This was now uh, Brad, who's in the audience, online audience, he was with us for here, but, um, um, you know, we would visit these women now, they're in the cemetery, but I, you know, they probably didn't think so, but I, I really did feel like I was a part of their lives and their family. Well, and, and 20 plus years later, we're still going back to visit, and that's how we got to meet Seth. Uh, so, <laughs> Seth, here's your claim to fame, and Steve and Shelly go to the panhandle. <laughs> so, yeah, in uh, 2020, uh, Steve and I started working on, well, I guess in 2019, we were working on another piece to this puzzle where we wanted to do more and think about more parts beyond the oral history interviews of were there diaries or letters that we could see, were there newspapers that we could see, what kind of information was there that we could round out the picture of our story. So we went back in January of 2020 and did another loop tour and that put us in uh, the No Man's Land Museum to look at the newspaper collection. So here's my big Aha uh -huh moment, there's me in the, the newspaper room at the museum, looking at hard copies of the Clayton News. And it was, I was this day years old uh, in January of 2020 when I learned that there was a she, she, she camp uh, not far from uh, the, the panhandle of Oklahoma in New Mexico. And that girls were going on these trips to go and get this training there. And since then, I've learned a lot more about she, she, she camps and have ambitions to, to write a piece about that also. Um, we continue to sort of build the story, continue to sort of find new leads and new trails and new connections is what we're doing. And if it weren't for places like museums that provided us these, these respites and, and pieces of an oasis, we wouldn't be able to make these connecting parts fit together. We just have a big old pile of Lego blocks and no instructions on how to build a house out of it. Yeah, so important to have places like um, No Man's Land Museum and and uh, those places. Keep up the good work, Seth. You know, Ken Turner let us use your space, but you, Seth, you let us come in the back and dig through things to, to keep our curiosity sparked and keep things going. I mean, we really, I work with a group called Facing History and Ourselves, and they have a tagline that people make choices and choices make history. And that's definitely true for the work that we've done with museums and collections and the Dust Bowl. 
you know, studying the gospel really does teach us these sorts of things. It helps us to engage with the past, but also to be much more empathetic of what people are doing and why they're making the choices that they make. You know, what it's like to build community and to remain rooted in that community through thick and thin. And that choice does equal change for better or for worse. And sometimes the change is for good. And sometimes the change is just different. And as certainly with the Duffel interviews that we did, and then the continued path we've had after that, you can see how choices and changes go together. Yeah, there's so much. I mean, you can listen to these uh, interviews and hear interesting stories and funny tidbits and whatever, but as a whole, as a whole collection, they really tell you so much about the day-to-day -day life of women in the area, what they were going through, how they were coping with it, uh, what they were doing to get by. It's just, it's, it's fascinating. As we continue to work, um, our current projects are continuing on our theme of community connections. We're also uh, looking at the women that we've talked to and several that we haven't and how they define their own space in terms of gender, in terms of family ties, in terms of generational transfer. Uh, we've also looked at women in leadership roles uh, using some home demonstration club records and sort of thinking about how women are recentering themselves and their families despite the isolated geography of places like the Panhandle in Texas County. And who knows what else, because we always have some new idea coming. Every time I read something, I have about 12 new questions, I think. I was gonna to say too, Shelley, on this, that um, if you go into, like I've been in the uh, Oklahoma Historical Society in Oklahoma City, uh, digging through their Dust Bowl, Depression era, uh, oral history recordings, and they're almost all men, right? They're almost, and, um, it's amazing how few uh, stories from the women there are um, kept and preserved. And I, I feel really proud of the work we did to, uh, to capture those and keep those for uh, hopefully forever. But, you know, uh, Seth has, I believe Seth, right? You can just nod the, uh, the copies of the interviews we did or they're somewhere in the museum there. Yeah. Uh, but you can, they're online. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but they're online and you can go visit them uh, right now if you want. Uh, uh, they're all transcribed and, uh, and you can listen and read and everything else. Well, and as you can tell, sometimes you need to listen and read because sometimes the, uh, the audio is all, everybody talking at the same time. So, you know, what, is, what a smart team of, of field researchers to think to take some notes as you go. So you could actually transcribe some of that. So it'd be useful information later. I wonder whose idea that was, right, to be able to do that and move forward. Uh, but that's all we have prepared to share with you today. I know, Stephen, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have <coughs> about the work we, we have done, the work we're doing, and how excited we are to find what, what brings us to the panhandle next. She's still alive. Did you visit Boy City and interview any of those folks? We did. We went to Boy City, spent some time in the Cimarron Heritage Center there. We also uh, talked to uh, people in Beaver County. Uh, we were in uh, pretty much every major community from about what, uh, Woodward? Woodward West. To the West. So we engaged Shattuck. Uh, we've been to Phelps. We've been Bye to side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we made the rounds. Slap out. <laughs> you know, was there was there a question? I can't hear that one. Yeah. Oh yeah, you have to get closer to Jim. I'm sure you've uh, seen Ken Ken Burns's documentary. He interviewed some of those the uh, same folks you did. Uh, uh, he gave he put together quite a lot of information. About he did. In fact, one that last. Ken Burns film, uh, the Dust Bowl, the, the one that's titled the Dust Bowl. Um, the, one of the one of the moments, and as every time I work on this project, Stephen and I will get to a finish line, we'll put it on the shelf and say, "Whoo, we're done with that," and then something will bring it back out again, either our curiosity or a new question. Or one time, it was because somebody from Oklahoma State called me. I don't know if they called you or not, Steve. I know I called you after they called me. They called me and they said, "You'll never believe who's been here looking at your interview collection and your field notes." 
And they told me it's somebody from Ken Burns' team. They're getting ready to start working on a new Dust Bowl documentary. So he bumped into us and we bumped into him. So it was pretty cool for our, our paths to cross on this particular project. So, so Shelly, how far did you delve into the CCC stuff? Well, I have just scratched the surface thanks to Seth's newspaper collections, but I do know that there is a, a digital archive of uh, mapping all of the places where they had the she, she, she camp. And so I have ambitions that the next time I have a sabbatical, I'll do a, a nationwide road trip and visit a few spots. Although I will be in Tulsa in a couple of weeks and there was a, 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 a she, she, she camp there that I may go by while I'm there. My dad was a ccc -er. My dad was CCC. Yeah, mm -hmm. Stanton County, Kansas. What was he working on? Uh, they they built a dam a dam across Bear Creek, and he was a stone cutter. That uh, mm -hmm. they had these huge, huge, huge uh, layers of sandstone, and he would they would go in in the winter and, or in the summer and drill holes in those layers and fill them full of water. And then in the winter, when it got real cold, it would freeze where the, where the water was in there and separate the layers of sandstone. And they <laughs> those out and they lined, cool. they lined the, uh, the mm. not the water <coughs> side, but the other side of the dam with that rock. And, they, mm. and he was one of those stone cutters. Where he was, I think he, I think he was only like 14. Wow. wow. He was doing that. That's cool. Those CCC guys were everywhere. Yeah. But Shelly, the the women's version of the CCC, what was, do you, do you know their real name? It wasn't she, she, she. That's what Eleanor but, Roosevelt called them. The she, she, Civilian she. Conservation Corps. Yeah. 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 Called the Civilian but, Conservation yeah, Corps. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll tell you in a few, uh, few months. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's really interesting. I'd like to see that stuff because my dad always told me stories about it when he was there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I tell you, Shelley, that's the you know, the people we talked to in Woodward, they would tell us their Dust Bowl stories, they, they weren't really in the Dust Bowl. Yeah, yeah. don't tell them we said that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they would say. Oh, after a big duster came in, we had to get the brooms out. Yeah, you know? <laughs> right. yeah not quite the same. Yeah, I, I worked for a gentleman in Texoma when I was going to college here. and told me stories about that, that uh, the ceiling fell out of their house mm -hmm. north of Texoma. And their ceiling fell out of their house because the dust blowed in there and weighted, out, weighted the sheetrock out of the ceiling of their house. Yeah, we heard more than one ceiling collapse story. <laughs> Just oh my incredible. Gosh. Actually, yeah. who was that, Shelly? I mean, I don't remember his name. It was uh, Stan, uh, not Standridge. There in Guyman, there was a guy that was building that machine to recreate the Dust Bowl dirt. Yeah, it was in that storefront on Main Street in Guyman. That, we did our interview. Stanfield? Yes. Yes. Stanfield. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he showed us this machine he was building, and he would put dirt in it, and it would chop it up like a giant blender. And he was pretty fascinated with replicating <laughs> the fine texture of the Dust Bowl mm -hmm. dirt. It was yeah. kind of crazy. Yeah, but very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my father's in the uh, audience right now, Curtis Mason. And uh, when I was a kid, he'd always tell me stories about when he was a child um, having to dig out from the Dust Bowl days, you know, because all the fences and everything would get buried and all the cattle would move across them. And, and uh, he spent a lot of his young, young life, I think, digging out from the Dust Bowl afterwards, you know. Yeah. Now, in, in, in the interviews from uh, Goodwell that are digitized in the collection, they tell a story about they're out walking around and they knew they were on drifts of snow or uh, drifts of, of dirt 
that reminded them of snow and they started to dig through it and they found that they were on top of like a hog house and they found three different buildings the kids had found and then they were all like in their own hog house underneath the dirt playing like it was a clubhouse and their parents were about to have a heart attack too <laughs> no, they were down there doing that. <laughs> it's just amazing how much dirt piled up you know i mean it's crazy The fascinating stories, I never get tired of hearing them. I never get tired of listening to them. I probably listen to every interview we've done at least seven or eight times. I hear something new every time, and I was there the first time. <laughs> so it's just a, it, it's a real gift, I feel like, that I got to participate in this. And then I just, I in, in some ways, like Steve, you were saying earlier, feeling like we we're part of the family for some of these these women that we had talked to, I, I almost feel like like I have a a debt of gratitude that I owe it to them to tell these stories and make sure other people hear these stories. Exactly. Larry. Oh, you're just clapping. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I thought so too, because we, they didn't know us and we just showed up there and they kind of came out and they really opened up and they poured out their hearts and souls and um, to us and I just uh, appreciate that so much every time I hear these stories. Well, you met some nice people. Oh, oh we my sure God. did. Yeah, because Norlene Peterson could be queen as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, Seth, you have, Seth, you have quite a collection of the pioneer queen information yeah. in, in your archive room, too. There's a project yeah, in there for somebody. She was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've got all that. Yeah. The archives are Sue's, were Sue's doing very much, so she she did, she got a lot of the grants for that and so on to do that, make our archives, to build that together and does all the cataloging and so on for it still as well, gets it all organized. Your newspaper collection is amazing. Yeah. Well, we were lucky and... Early on, we were the only repository in the area, so we managed to collect papers from a wide, wide area. Yeah. They're in great condition. They're well organized. It's it's really very user friendly. Even though even if you come in like me, you don't really know what you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Is that it? Are we done? That's it. Well, if you don't have other questions for us, we maybe have taken up enough of your time for today. But it has been our pleasure, for sure, to get to talk with you. Absolutely. Yeah, that was definitely awesome. Thank you, guys. Well, thank, thank you. you. Take yeah. care, Scott. Take care, y'all. <laughs> See y'all soon. <laughs> See you. Bye, Shelly. Bye, Steve. Y'all have a good Bye. night. Thank you. So much. Bye. Appreciate it very much. Are we done? Are we done, Shelly? Uh, right. yeah, she's gone. So I guess <laughs> I guess you're done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks, Seth. Thanks for everything. It's been a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Come back sometime. <laughs> okay. We probably will. Still, I still. Is he still? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean,